You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Hello, friends. Welcome back to Questions for Corbett. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you might remember this as the once-monthly, now occasional podcast in which you ask the questions and I answer them. And I say might remember because it has been a while since the last one, and it was a while before since the one before that, which actually brings us to our very first question right off the bat. Uh, Davis uh, wrote an email. Is there a schedule for your question vids? Are we informed if our cues are chosen? Thank you for the question, Davis, but I'm afraid the answers are no and no. And yes, I absolutely should send the email to let people know when their question has been chosen and say, you know, you should watch this latest questions for Corbett. But even that is too much administrative work for me at the moment. So I'm sorry. I'm afraid I often don't get around to doing that. Uh, that will change. I really hope that will change in the new year because I really am going to be working towards getting a real in-life actual assistant to help me with such administrative tasks. But in the meantime, I hope you will uh, forgive me. And yes, the questions uh, for Corbett videos are occasional at this point. It's when the questions add up and when when I feel like it and when the stars align. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, I don't mean that literally. I'm just saying uh, it's a question of when when do I feel like doing this? And it's not every single month uh, at this point. So it is what it is. Uh, as always, many ways to get your questions in. You can email me like Davis did uh, through the contact form on CorbettReport.com. You can record yourself leaving a message, an audio message through the SpeakPipe application. Or uh, perhaps most importantly, as a Corbett Report member, you can log in and leave your question in the comment section for this Questions for Corbett on CorbettReport.com. But speaking of audio questions from the SpeakPipe application, you might remember that last time on this series, I was lamenting the fact that it seems like I get a lot of the same questions over and over and over and there are no new questions under the sun. Well, thanks to uh, listener Akachi, I... <laughs> we have definitely solved that problem. I think a lot of the listeners who uh, were trying to find new and creative questions to ask, well, I think Akachi, uh, Akachi won that particular contest with this question. The Biafran War. Your thoughts on it, Mr. Corbett? My thoughts on the Biafran War... Good question. Thank you for the question, Akachi. Uh, my thoughts are uh, Nigeria, right? I actually had to look up, apparently, 1967, 1970, Nigerian Civil War. Uh, there, <laughs> there are amazingly limits to my knowledge and my expertise and my experience, and uh, this runs up into them. I know nothing whatsoever about the Biafran War, but I'm always looking to learn more about pretty much everything on the planet, so if anyone has anything interesting to tell me about it, please do so. Um, but there you go. There are questions out there that I really can't answer and am not qualified to and will not attempt to. So thank you for, uh, for pointing that out, Akachi. And that is the other side of it. You have to ask me something that I know about or know something about, but that I, uh, haven't answered before. So it is, it's, uh, an ever, uh, shrinking, uh, eye of the needle to fit your thread through. Um, but... Luckily, Akachi did have a subsequent attempt with a different uh, piece of audio, so let's go to Akachi's other question. Do you think Bashar al-Assad is like the modern-day Fran Archduke Franz Ferdinand insofar as his death would lead to a World War III scenario, same as Archduke's death led to a World War I? Hmm. Hmm. An interesting point. An interesting horrifying point. Uh, well, to answer your question directly, uh, well, no, Akachi, I never really thought of it in those terms until you just presented that idea. And now I do see at least the potential for some nightmarish historical parallels. So that is, that is something to keep in mind. Um, and I think, I hope this will have particular relevance and uh, resonance for those who have watched my presentation, for example, from last year in Denmark on uh, Echoes of World War I, talking about the very many historical parallels between the situation of the world back in 1914 and the situation in the world today and the po possibility of world war eventuating once again. I'd never really thought of Syria and potentially the death of Assad as that type of catalyst, but 
a lot of the things do line up, doesn't it? At, at any rate, it does certainly bring in uh, the prospect of great powers. Um, what a terrible phrase coming into the situation and and kicking something off. So it is a, it is a possibility. I don't think it's the most likely way that some sort of World War Three uh, scenario would uh, happen, even if World War Three scenario like World War One does happen, which was another point that I made in my Echoes of World War I presentation, but it is at the very least a possibility and something very intriguing to think about. So thank you for uh, getting my the hamster wheel in my brain spinning on that one. That's uh, very interesting. All right. Uh, well, that's going to be the way we roll in this edition of Questions for Corbett. I'm going to try to keep my answers relatively brief, although I'm sure I could expound for hours upon each and every single one of the points raised here, but uh, <laughs> I will attempt not to do so in the interest of time and in the interest of trying to answer as many questions as possible. I always say it, but let's see if I can actually do it this month. Uh, of course, first of all, I'll direct people to the comment section of the previous edition of Questions for Corbett, where, as always, there's a lively uh, back and forth and all sorts of things uh, in the comments section from the community members of Corbett Report, and including people asking questions and the community chiming in with their own answers, which is what I love to see. I love to see that um, because obviously I don't think this is about me having all the answers and being the guru. It's about all of us coming to this information from many different perspectives. And on that note, I will particularly point people's attention to a, a comment that was left by Radish, who um, wonders if we can take the hex off Snowden because he was right about everything. And there was a very lively back and forth about Snowden and what he was and what he revealed or what he didn't and gatekeeper and all of that stuff in the comment section itself. I won't attempt to read it all out for you, but I will direct you there so you can read it for yourself along with the other questions and comments there. But there was a, a question that I did want to address specifically because this was apparently the second time that uh, this user has attempted to bring it to my attention, so I might as well uh, take it head on. Uh, Joseph uh, writes, uh, what keeps Saudi Aramco's IPO from happening on China's new paper castle slash oil futures exchange? Uh, Saudi U.S. petrodollar will have to get shorted eventually. A financial Thucydides trap, if you will. Apparently, Qatar was al already doing yuan-denominated contracts for their carbon chains, according to a AT, Asia Times, and Pepe Escobar. And there's a link there to uh, a Pepe Escobar article. So thank you for the question, uh, Joseph. Uh, technically, I mean, I guess the answer is uh, nothing necessarily prevents this from happening. It certainly could happen. And as I have reported before, China did offer to outright purchase a, a, the 5% stake in Saudi Aramco. For people who have no idea about this story, Saudi Aramco, the state-owned oil company, uh, is uh, doing an IPO. It's going public, at, I think, in a 5% stake for the first time ever. And there's been a lot of talk about where they're going to list and that kind of thing. But while this story was Coming to the fore, uh, I believe Reuters broke the story back in uh, last October, if memory serves, that China just outright offered to buy the 5% stake. We will put, put down the money and we'll take that 5% stake in Saudi Aramco, which is very interesting. And as I've pointed out many times, portends the sort of shifting geopolitical slash military slash geoeconomic relations that are happening in the world, the changeover that's happening to the new multipolar world and blah, 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 and the petro yuan, and it touches on all of those different aspects. Um, but interestingly, of course, Saudi Aramco has at least not yet uh, taken that 5% outright uh, purchase from China, so they're not doing that yet. Um, again, it could happen, but uh, I don't think it's even the most likely way that this petro yuan shift, petro -yuan shift is going to take place. I, I do see that happening and coming together, and there are many signs of it, and offering the oil futures contract uh, denominated in yuan, for example, is one step towards that. As I wrote about in the forecaster a couple of months ago, uh, the birth of the petro yuan. Uh, but... Uh, again, I don't think that necessarily, I'm, certainly China and Saudi, if they were wedded more formally and Saudi took more definite steps away from the U.S. military slash uh, economic umbrella, that would be a decisive shift in global geopolitics and would absolutely pretend the, if not the, the complete demise of the petrodollar, at least a significant blow to it. Um, but having said that, we know that uh, Trump and and uh, the Saudi royals, or at least the uh, the prince king in waiting, are buddy buddies, and they've just uh, completed you know the big arms deal and all of this. So 
it's it seems like Saudi is not looking to step away from the U.S. umbrella at this point. I think the more interesting shift that's taking place, at least right at this precise moment, is Iran. What happens with Iran? If U.S. sanctions Iran and if they're strict on European companies sanctioning Iran, China is more than happy to fill in that void. And it was interesting. One of the first stories we saw after the U.S. decided to reimpose the sanctions uh, was uh, China stepping up and saying, hey, you guys, we'll, we'll be happy to take over uh, t- France's uh, totals place in the South Pars gas field. Just let us in there. We'll we'll buy out their, their stake for sure. So I think the China-Iran axis is maybe going to be more important um, stepping forward from here. But thank you for the question, um, Joseph. Let's move on to Joss, who uh, writes an email. I'm very interested now in people's attitudes to Maxine Waters' statements regarding not associating with members of the Trump administration. A lot of self-professed liberty-minded commentators claim she is inciting riots and must be stopped. I became skeptical when I saw the mainstream media push back on her. If humanity is to regain its freedom from illegitimate authority, surely a mass movement of uh, people refusing to voluntarily associate with representatives of that authority would be a reasonable method to take to go about it. Obviously, it would have to be done on a bipartisan basis rather than just against a single wing of the two-party system. Okay, thank you for the question, Joss. Uh, For people who really don't know... This is about a story about someone in the Trump administration getting refused service in a restaurant. And then Maxine Waters comes out and says, uh, you know, uh, this is great. We should do this more. We have to um, show these people that they can't be part of our society, essentially. And so now people are outraged about her outrage. And it's the outrage uh, cycle eating the snake, eating its own tail. Um, And the question if the question is, uh, you know, what should. What should a, a truly liberty-minded person's role be or take on this be? It's, I mean, obviously, who has the right or the authority to come in and start uh, stop people from associating with each other or to force people to associate with each other? Um, of course, the answer is no one. Of course, the state does not have or should not have the ability to do that. And, um, of course, I hear the... <laughs> increasingly inaccurately named the Libertarian Party leaders, uh, Gary Johnson acolytes in the crowd sc- screaming that the the Jew must bake the swastika cake. But, um, well, actually more on that specific issue in the very near future, I hope, in an interview I'm going to be conducting, so stay tuned for that. But yes, I mean, ultimately, this is a point about freedom of association and disassociation, which are, of course, two sides of the same coin. So, of course, any restaurant should be allowed to uh, refuse service to anyone that they don't want to serve. And the customers and the public should be able to say, I don't like what you did there, so I won't go to your place. And that's how it should work. Um, Let's move to Sandy Feet, who writes, I've just read that USA has told Japan to stop buying oil from Iran, which is 5% of oil needs of Japan. I was in Beppu, where there was lots of thermal, uh, geothermal activity, lots of hot water. Do you know if there are any tech advances happening regarding using this resource in local communities around Japan? On a similar note, is there much use of, of or demand for eco-fuels, which require planting crops for fuel in Japan? All right, thank you for the the question, um, Sandy Feet. It is important and apt, especially in the light of this Iran sanction stuff going on and well, yes, if Japan gets 5% of its oil from Iran, then what is, what's it going to do if it's you can't do that anymore? I covered these types of issues in episode 237 of the podcast, Fukushima's Biggest Secret, where I talked about the issue of, well, how does Japan get power now that it doesn't have its nuclear power at the time, back in uh, 2012, I believe, when that podcast came out. So uh, that was the issue back then. Maybe it was 2011. Um, but now, obviously, um, several years later, it's still a question of Japan's energy security, as it were, um, and how it will secure energy for its population. Um, But now there are, it's not just a nuclear issue, now there's even oil uh, supply disruptions to take into account. Um, So bringing things a little bit more up to date from that podcast episode, which I'd still recommend you listen to, and I'll put the link in the show notes. uh, As of 2014, there is now a Fukushima Renewable Energy Institute. So at the very least, they're trying to sort of use Fukushima as the brand and the rallying cry for more research into renewable energies. But, you know, let's take the official sponsored institute research on those types of things with a little grain of salt more on which in a moment. But yes, as you correctly point out, Japan does have a great degree of of geothermal potential, uh, energy potential, as 
you would expect from a nation that is highly volcanic and highly er earthquake prone on the Ring of Fire. Yes, it is a highly geothermal uh, nation. And as you also point out, uh, when you go to Beppu Onsen, for example, yeah, it's, uh, it's used primarily for hot springs at this point. Hot spring resorts are very popular in Japan, and that's how, where a lot of the geothermal uh, energy potential is being used at this point. It's basically to boil water for hot springs. Um, but, I mean, there, uh, Japan is known for, internationally, it does have and has worked on the problem of uh, how do you tap into geothermal energy, and it has spread those types of technologies and ideas around the world. Now it is actually being encouraged to apply those discoveries at home. Well, why don't you use it yourselves, guys? Uh, but let's keep the entire geothermal uh, part of this in perspective, um, it's highly unlikely that the geothermal activity here in Japan, unless, I mean, at least with the current technologies and the current processes, is ever going to take up even the 5% of oil that Iran is apparently supplying Japan at this point. Um, uh, worldwide, total global geothermal energy production at this point is 12.8 gigawatts, which, to put it in perspective, is less than 2% of global energy capacity. Um, and to put that in perspective, oil is 33%, coal is 30%, natural gas is 24%. So those are the numbers as they stand today. Um, there, are, As I pointed out in episode 237, there are a lot of innovative ideas that are possible and new ways of trying to tap into energies that exist. Tidal energy, for example, which of course would be uh, if it, that can be effectively harnessed, would be an incredible boon for Japan, obviously the island nation. But um, at this point, these sources are still relatively minuscule. And um, the energies, the, the renewable or, or non-oil, non coal, gas, nuclear types of energies that could really make a difference, the whatever, 21st century flying hover car, zero-point energy kind of breakthroughs um, that we could have had by now, should have had by now. Uh, do you really think that burning oil and gasoline is still the most e efficient form of technology that we could come up with? It's now a 150-year-old idea. Uh, is that really still the best thing that we could possibly do? Probably not. And these alternative technologies and energies are undoubtedly being suppressed. But then it's always a question of finding your way through all the charlatans who are using that that feeling that we all have, well, this can't be right, to try to scam people into supporting their scams. So a lot of scams go on in that arena. Uh, and there's no easy way out. I'm not going to tie this up with a bow and tell you, here's the solution and everything will be fine from here on out. No, it's a, it's a process of, of trying to get, yeah, trying to get more uh, in terms of renewable energies. But still, at this point, it's less than 2% of global energy production. And uh, that ain't going to change anytime soon, unless we get the big reveal of some zero-point energy kind of thing or something like that, some game-changer. Not holding my breath, sadly. All right, let's move on to Alistair. Uh, I wonder, given the power, reach, and influence of the powers that shouldn't be, that if they saw the truth movement begin to reach critical mass, would they not simply enact war? Perhaps using the method uh, just mentioned earlier in that email that I won't read. But, but people can always uh, be brought to the bidding of the leaders, Herman Goering. Uh, in principle, I agree and like ideas around societies based on decentralized power. If I'm not mistaken, in a religious context, Jesus and Muhammad prop, uh, proposed decentralized models of faith only to have men try successfully, in many cases, to centralize religious power. I wonder, given man's disposition for ultimately elevating himself above the needs of society, certainly the 4% anyway, what is the answer? Regardless, it seems to me that the powers that shouldn't be still hold the cards, and a truth movement at critical mass would only hasten them to play these cards. No, I don't think there is an alternative, uh, and sooner is better. Allowing all ourselves to wander aimlessly, wander aimlessly, I suppose, towards a, a Kurzweil singularity would be a mistake of monumental proportions. It seems to me the greatest possibility for hope in a brighter future might very well come out of the chaos that they will likely seek to cause in the near future. That is, after all, when they will have the least amount of control over their fate and ours. Your thoughts? Okay, you raise a number of important points here, Alistair. And uh, I, I, I understand and agree with the broad points that you're making here and the, what, what you're, you're saying. And you raise a very interesting point at the end, which is that the chaos that they're going to have to bring about in order to change us over into the new world order system they want is 
the only thing that in some way will free things up for a change to happen in a different direction. Uh, if we're going to have any hope in ch fundamentally changing the course of society, which right now is barreling like an out of control freight train down the tracks towards this technocratic uh, surveillance control grid that we see being slotted into space, uh, into place right now. And that I've been detailing for years and years on the Corbett Report. We see that happening. We see uh, we're being directed that way. And we see the chaos that's happening right now as the kind of liquef liquef liquefaction of current relations that allows the space for the, the emergence of this new order to arise. That also is the one point when, when all of these set and solidified frozen relations start to, un uh, start to thaw. Uh, is the only time in which we really have the ability to, okay, let's steer this freight train in the other direction. Let's go somewhere else. Um, and it's in these chaotic moments that we do have the freedom and the, the ability to do that, and more people will be receptive to alternative ideas. So I think you're right. There is a there is a window of opportunity, and that's essentially what my work is about, is using that window of opportunity. Um, the other... I mean, the other side of what you're saying there is that essentially, yeah, well, if things really start to go out of control for them, well, they can just always play the war card or whatever, the nuclear false flag card or whatever it is. They're, they're ace up the sleeve. They just pull that one out and put it on the table and, oh, you know, they get whatever they want. Well, maybe so, but what is the alternative to what is our response to that? Well, oh, well, I guess they can do whatever they want whenever they want. So let's stop trying. Well, if that's your conclusion, I don't know why you'd even be watching this podcast, and I certainly don't know why I'd be doing it. As I've said many times before, if, if that was my attitude, I'd be in the corner sucking my thumb and just waiting for the inevitable end. I'm not, so I don't know. I, I certainly can't say we are going to win this and we are going to change things for the better. I hope we are, and that's part of what I'm doing and part of what I assume everyone out there wants to accomplish, and uh, unless we start moving our ourselves in that direction, we'll never be able to move society in that direction, we'll never be able to change the course of world history. So uh, I think that's one thing that I'd like to stress, that the so-called would-be elites know that the average Joe Sixpack doesn't think about, which is that, yes, you have to create the structures and the infrastructure and, and work tirelessly and diligently for years decades, generations even, to prepare the way for a certain change in society. It can be done, but it's like you know, it's like any other human process. It takes a large amount of preparation and background for a smooth transition to happen. And uh, this is something that they know about very well. This is why they have all of these organizations and conferences and think tanks and all of this, uh, all the propaganda from the mainstream media and all of these billions upon trillions of dollars that have been spent in propagandizing and preparing the minds of the public for these various transitions. Because they know it's a huge undertaking and it takes a lot of framework and preparation and at the in the end as i also want to stress it's not that these people are writing a script and every single thing happens exactly as they say when they say they're not omnipotent gods controlling the planet they are people who realize that change is happening and they want to steer it in this direction or steer it in that direction that is the same power that we have to steer it in the direction we want to go in. We can steer this thing towards a completely different direction. We can steer it towards the agoristic, voluntaristic, open society that we want, rather than the open society of Soros, you know, the open society foundation or whatever, uh, the new world order. I mean, in a sense, we all want a new world order. It's only a question whether you want the new world order or whether you want a better of uh, world order even itself is a problematic phrase because it implies there's some sort of top-down hierarchical structuring that's going on, etc. But you get my drift, I hope. All right, anyway, a very interesting philosophical question, and I'm sure there's a lot uh, to be said back and forth, so I will invite your participation in the comment section on that one. Um, let's move on to Marino, who writes, uh, Your short uh, video, 9-11, A Conspiracy Theory, made six year years ago, is nowhere to be found on the YouTube search engine. It has almost 3 million views and yet nothing. I've scrolled one mile and still nothing. 
But there is a channel, Global Research TV, that uploaded the original video mentioning you with that same thumbnail of George Bush and counts only 90k views. Your video is not deleted. It's on your channel. I know YouTube censors videos, but to make it completely disappear from the search engine is really odd. Yes, it is really odd. Thank you for pointing that out, Marino. And in fact, this is something that I noticed a, a couple of years ago. Uh, I can't remember exactly when, but it's been at least a couple of years, maybe a few years. I noticed it was getting harder and harder for me to search that video and I just wanted to look it up on YouTube and instead of going through my creator studio back end thing, just looking in the search engine, 9-11 and conspiracy theory, it was getting harder and harder. Like it would be the, the 12th result and then it'll be on like the second page of results. And then I'd have to put it in quotation marks. It was that exact phrase. I get it. 9-11 conspiracy theory is kind of, uh, it was purposefully a very general title that could have, you know, millions of results. But you would think, again, this viral video, millions of views on my channel, millions of views combined on other people's channels, hundreds of thousands of uh, downloads directly from my website, you would think that this would be higher in the search ranking. But no, it was it was getting pushed progressively further and further down the search results. And now, yeah, now I've heard from you and uh, Brock West uh, was just letting me know this today and other people have uh, pointed it out. And I, myself too, you cannot search that video on YouTube anymore. You put in the exact title, you put in quotation marks, you do whatever, you even put Corbett or Corbett Report next to it. You cannot get that video from the search bar anymore. This is, a, this is a type of censorship I think most people don't even know is happening right now. I mean, we all know the searches are being structured and whatever, but you literally cannot search this video anymore. Um, at least as far as I, I mean, I've tried everything and I cannot find it in the search bar anymore. It's still there. It's still on my channel. It's still up there, but they do not want you to find it, interestingly. But with that video and with a lot of my other videos, it is posted everywhere, all sorts of different channels. And you'll find, I think, probably everyone knows it as the 9-11 in five minutes video. And that's what everyone calls it, although that's not the title. You search that, I'm pretty sure that one's still up. That was one of the other people who uploaded it. Global Research uploaded it. Many people have uploaded in many locations. And that's why it is good to have multiple people uploading these things all over the place because they can censor me and they have and they do, but they can't censor everyone and adjust the algorithm for everyone. Well, maybe that's coming that later down the line. But at this point, that's probably the only way that video is being disseminated other than people sending the direct links to other people. It's probably um, other uploads of it that's being found in the search bar right now and maybe being recommended. I don't know if that video ever shows up in anyone's recommended videos. So it's interesting. And that's, of course, precisely why I've been screaming my head off about creating all and supporting alternative social media structures for years now. And that's why people like Ray Vahi heard my call and started bitshoot.com. And, you know, th this is extremely important. This truly is the foundation of everything. I don't care what you believe or don't believe or what conspiracy you're into or not into. If you, if uh, without these, the ability to use and access these platforms, we don't even understand how our view of the world is being shaped because you can't know what you're not finding in the search bar. And this is an example of it. Hey guys, type 9 11 and conspiracy theory into the search bar, you won't find my YouTube video. What other things are being truly censored from the search bar? You don't know. You can't know. And what you can't know won't ever affect what you think, and you'll never encounter that information. So think about that. And uh, that's exactly why we need social media alternatives. Remember that social media alternative series I was doing that was deeply, wildly unpopular, <laughs> greeted with rank unenthusiasm from the crowd, and if not outright scorn and vitriol? <laughs> well, anyway, this is why we need to explore many, many, many alternatives. We need to create many other platforms, and we need to stop giving them tube all our power. Okay, uh, let's move on to Patrick. Hello, James. Good work. I have a question for Corbett. Isn't gunpowder and all explosives chemicals? If so, wouldn't that end all warfare? Uh, thanks. Keep up your good work. Patrick, P.S. Google says gunpowder is a chemical. Thanks. Please give your opinion on this matter. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Patrick. You know, that's a good point. Let's criminalize war. And I'm not even joking about that. Just watch my video on criminalized war clubs uh, from several years ago, talking about uh, an idea in Malaysia to literally criminalize war, as it should be. Of course, now it's theoretically criminal. It's the supreme war crime to start, aggressively start a, a war um, without justification or pretext or whatever. But of course, I mean, the Iraq war and all of that. 
victory. Justice is always meted out by the victors. So, you know, obviously. But but it's a good point. And I think it's uh, maybe one of those splinters that can get in the minds of some people um, who might be otherwise opposed to the idea. So, um... Let's move on to Mohammed, who writes, Hope all is well. James, are there any parallels between any of the so-called 9-11 hijackers and Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, for example, I heard some or one of the 9-11 hijackers once listed his address at a military base. I wonder if Lee Harvey Oswald did the same or was in the military. Are there other similarities? Uh, thank you for the question, Mohammed. Yes, for those who don't know, Lee Harvey Os uh, Oswald was not just some random Joe Sixpack. And he was indeed in the military, but he was no army grunt. He was uh, a Marine who was given special training in the Russian language, was posted to the highly top secret naval air facility at Atsugi in Japan, um, back when Atsugi was running the U-2 program, back when the U-2 program was still top secret and no one knew about. So uh, clearly not just an ev everyday average, you know, uh, army grunt type of person. Um, he contracted a venereal disease in the line of duty while stationed in Japan. Uh, he defected to the Soviet Union using money that he didn't have and then waltzed back into the U.S. at the height of the Cold War. Yeah, I, yeah you know, I revoked my, my passport and all that. But hey, you know what? I, I want to come back. And so they did a little comeback interview and then he was cleared and he got in. And then he started agitating for, you know, communists in Cuba and starting fistfights on the street and all of this, all of this craziness surrounding the Lee Harvey Oswald story. And it's funny, most people probably don't know half of that, any of that at this point. They just know, oh yeah, he was just some crazy nut. Maybe they know he was, he was kind of a commie sympathizer or something. And yeah, that's why he did it. Uh, it's amazing when you start to tear the pieces of the Lee Harvey Oswald story apart and look at it. It's just in your face ridiculous, the things they want you to just kind of gloss over in that story. So in that sense, I think there are a lot of parallels with the the hijackers, the so-called hijackers, and Muhammad Atta uh, being obviously the ringleader or so so called and self-styled in the in the media. I think you, there's a lot of things to look at, including the fact that, yes, several of the hijackers had been identified by name as being the same person as were being trained at U.S. military facilities. But then a few days later, oh, we looked into it. It was different people. End of story. <laughs> things like that. Uh, those types of little nuggets of information are, again, vastly telling. And the whole story about the, you know, the meeting in Malaysia and uh, the CIA forgetting to tell the FBI, that, oh, by the way, they're coming into the U.S. and all of this stuff. Or not forgetting. Actually, as we know, explicitly not telling them. Making the deliberate and conscious decision not to tell them, not withholding information. Again, whatever you think about the hijackers and what what they did or didn't do, or whether they were there or not there, or whether there were planes or it was all holograms and UFOs or whatever, whatever you think, it's still valuable and worthwhile to tear apart this official story and the ridiculous legend that they've created around it, because that is where you find, you know, then you can shove it in people's face. What you are being told about Lee Harvey Oswald is ridiculous nonsense. Look at this nonsense. This cannot be possible. Uh, look at this crap they're trying to tell you about the 9-11 hijackers. It is garbage. It cannot be the case. Uh, this is good, solid stuff that comes from the, from the official story to debunk the official story. There is a value and purpose in that, which is why I hate to see when the 9-11 truth movement just waves its hands. Oh, you know, there were no hijackers, so let's never talk about them or, or what we're supposed to believe about them. No, it's valuable to take apart the official story to show undeniably from within the logic of the official debunked story itself. It debunks itself. Uh, there's also, I mean, not just the Lee Harvey Oswald Patsy kind of parallels, but also there's some interesting parallels to the OKC false flag with the 9-11 hijackers. So uh, a lot more to explore there, and I will do so in future work. So thank you for bringing that up, Mohammed. And we'll move on to Tom. A student is planning to use uh, this subject as a thesis for PhD, referring to Pearl Harbor. He is in the belief that that whole episode was a false flag attack to maneuver the U.S. to join the war. Where could one obtain factual information to back up such allegations? Would the White House have such facts in archives available to the public? And would higher institutes of learning in Japan have such publications available on the realities of that incident? What is your take on this matter? 
All right, thank you for the question. Straightforward answer. Type Pearl Harbor into the Corbett Report search engine, and you will find ample ample uh, threads to start your search. Um, d different information and documentation coming from different sources and conversations I've had, interviews I've done on this topic in the past. Lots of different threads there to start exploring um, and the links to the information itself, as always. Um, just as a note of clarification, I don't use the term false flag to describe Pearl Harbor because I think that's the wrong analogy. It wasn't a false flag attack. It was a real attack that really happened. The Japanese really did it, but it was set up in a lot of different ways. And again, much more detail in the interviews that I've conducted on that subject in the past. So please look them up. Uh, all right, let's wrap this up with a couple of questions for you. You might remember sometimes at the end of the podcast here, I like to throw around some of the questions I get to the general audience to get your guys' take on it and draw on the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, don't let me down. Uh, the first one comes from Terry. Uh, I'm not much of a techie, don't like clouds, Microsoft, Apple, etc. much, and do like privacy, and I seem to need a new computer. I've had an Apple MacBook Pro since about 2010, and it's been fine. I used to have the ability to run PC programs on it, but that doesn't work anymore. I do have Ghostery, OpenOffice, and Virtual Shield on it. What I use on a computer includes email, web browsing, music and photo storing and processing, a bit of downloading of books and videos. I'm open to something other than Apple, and I expect you get the general idea. Uh, do you have any recommendations or recommendations for websites or other information that might help me choose? Okay, that's the first one, and then a highly related question from Barbara. I'm a supporter who has a bit of a problem. I'm wondering if you could help me and others with similar worries in a nutshell. I don't trust my antivirus software. Is it secure, private, or is it doing nefarious things to me and my data? I realize open source antivirus software would be insanely problematic to keep up to date, but is there something else that is somewhat more secure? What are your thoughts on this and what do you use? All right, uh, again, good questions. Uh, I know there are techies in the crowd who can answer this in much greater depth and detail and with much more precision than I can, so I open it up. Question for you, can anyone in the comment section provide some good recommendations and answers on these questions. As always, leave your questions, make your comments. I'm always interested to hear back from you. Uh, Corporate Report members should log into the website and leave their questions or comments in the comment section of this post on CorbettReport.com. Well, that's going to do it for this time. Let's tie it up, uh, put a bow on it, and I will be talking to you again in the near future. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Thanks for tuning in. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.